Well, while they're switching over, I want to thank the Book Manufacturers Institute for inviting me to this event. As a department chairman, I spend most of my time doing analytic work and producing reports that I kind of submit upward through the food chain. And of course, nobody actually reads the reports, but they have to check boxes, and I'm a well-behaved bureaucrat. So uh, just having the opportunity to look at human faces instead of staring at my computer screen is, is always a pleasure. And there we go. Okay. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a change of pace. I know that most of the presentations at this event are going to be ones focused on the book manufacturers industry and when talking about governmental or policy issues will be focused on ones that are directly relevant to the industry. But, so this is a little bit of a change of pace, but uh, I will have a few comments to make toward the end that I think bear more directly on, on books. Um, and perhaps lamenting uh, the, you know, the displacement of books that sometimes people cite in the, in the face of technological change and calling for them to remain in our lives. Uh, and hopefully I will have a little bit of time left at the end that we can use for questions and, and discussion. Political polarization is a problem that you hear uh, referenced a lot in contemporary discussions. It's something that's lamented by large portions of the public, by political pundits, by politicians, as something that is on the rise and increasingly problematic, damaging the body politic. It's often treated either as coincident with or as a sort of a consequence of you know, well, there are various terms you'll see tossed about things like hyper-partisanship, identity politics, political tribalism, political extremism, and the like. What are its problematic consequences? Well, I mean, if you want to kind of sum them up, I think it's basically that, that toxic, you know, overheated, divisive rhetoric and institutional gridlock increasingly displace constructive dialogue, consensus, and effective problem solving. Now, one of the things I would caution against before talking a little bit about political polarization and how it's evolved in recent decades, I think it's important that we not kind of mythologize uh, U.S. history and imagine that up until a few decades ago, U.S. history was characterized by, you know, these lovely levels of political tranquility and consensus and harmony and uh, effective policy making. Our country has, from its inception, periodically, you know, witnessed dramatic levels of political conflict and partisanship. Sometimes these have even erupted into, you know, fairly significant levels of violence. I mean, the period leading up to and during the Civil War, for example, would hardly be characterized as a period of political tranquility and harmony and consensus. Similarly, and I guess here I date myself, I sometimes have to remember when I'm talking to students in classes that things I will talk about or use as examples or illustrations that have you know, enormous significance for me, they'll look at me and just kind of have these puzzled looks on their faces. But you know, when I refer to things like the, 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 the late 60s and early 70s and the divisiveness over America's involvement in Vietnam and the counterculture, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they just look at me. I mean, it's like I'm talking about the Civil War or the Constitutional period or something. But, you know, if you just look back historically, it's important not to be so concerned with the rising levels of political polarization that you, you, know, you end up mythologizing some tranquil American past. Even the principal architects of the US Constitution, if you look at the works, at the writings, and the rhetoric of, of individuals like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, who were part of this group that I guess you could say were sort of the winning team and the constitutional deba debates, this group that came to be known as the Federalists, even the principal architects of the US Constitution focused a lot of attention on what they characterized as factionalism. And they said that the mischief of faction was the principal problem that governments of all sorts have to contend with. Here we're talking about Democrats, self-professed or self-labeled Democrats and self-professed Republicans uh, in the general population. Well, here, you know, I don't have, you know, 
quite anything as recent as 2017, but you can see here uh, between 1994 and 2014, there was a fairly significant rise in sort of the percentage of both Democrats and Republicans who have an extremely negative view of the other party. And then what do they say about each other? Um, again, this is derived from, from the Pew Research Center's uh, survey, surveys that they periodically conduct. This is, this is just from a, a 2016 survey. You can see here that there's a pretty significant percentage of Democrats and Republicans who have, ex who, you know, essentially offer extremely negative characterizations, very pointedly negative characterizations of the other party. Uh, Republicans, um, you know, tend to say of Democrats that they're closed-minded, they're immoral. Almost half are saying that Democrats are immoral. Almost half say they're lazy, they're dishonest. 32% that they're unintelligent. Likewise, um, 70% uh, of Democrats polled uh, characterized Republicans as being closed-minded, 42% dishonest, 35% immoral, 33% unintelligent, and 18% lazy. Um, that's, pretty, that's pretty strong stuff. I mean, they're not just saying that they have policy disagreements with one another. They're actually offering pointedly hostile characterizations of those who are not, I guess you could say, part of their ideological or partisan faction, if we were to use the constitutional era you know, nomenclature there. There's also been a sort of a, 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 an associated rise in levels of political polarization in Congress in terms of partisanship and legislative activity. Um, so here what we're going to be looking at are a number of slides on sort of the, sort of the, the ideological and partisan disposition uh, of congressional and uh, uh, representatives in both the House and senators in the U.S. Senate going back at a very early point in terms of a no, you know, various things that have been used to measure kind of their, their intensity of of ideological or partisan disposition. As you can see here uh, over time, what, what, what this chart is showing is again, there has been an increasing divergence, of, a much, a, a very powerful divergence, especially in the last few decades between Republicans and Democrats in the House of Representatives. Similarly, in the Senate, you see the same thing, an increasing divergence between Senate Republicans and Senate Democrats in terms of where they, they kind of lie when it comes to partisan positions and intensity. How about if we just look at the percentage uh, or the sort of the prominence of so-called centrist Republicans and centrist Democrats? Um, similarly here, this is actually looking at non-centrist, you can see that in the last few decades there's been a, a, a in particular, in the House of Representatives, a, a pretty profound increase in the percentage of Republican House members who are, are not centrist, they're non-centrist. The Senate is not nearly as uh, pronounced in that regard. The Senate because it, you know, senators represent entire states rather than, you know, oftentimes kind of strategically carved house districts, they tend to have to deal with a broader set of constituents and tend to be less partisan in their orientation. But even in the Senate, you can see there's an increasing divergence here between the two parties and a corresponding decline in centrism politically. And finally, don't try to make sense of this. I just stuck it in there because I thought it looked kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, you can do all kinds of interesting things now with, with uh, analytic mapping technology to create cool charts that uh, if you go through them rapidly enough, nobody will know actually what, they're, what they mean and you won't have to say what they mean, but people will think, wow, it must be really smart there. But uh, I didn't create this. But, um, this is just a chart that's designed to dis display the, 
sort of the level of bipartisan legislative activity within the Senate over a period of several decades, the closer the sort of the blue and red um, you know, circles are there, the, the more that means there was some level of bipartisan legislative activity and consensus. Uh, over time, especially in the last couple of decades, you can see that the level of bipartisanship in legislative activity has declined markedly and there's been a far greater divergence uh, in, in, between the two parties. Okay, so those are some interesting charts and, and visuals evidencing what people have characterized as the rising levels of po political polarization in the United States. What do political scientists regard as some of the major factors that might be contributing to the increasing levels of political polarization? Uh, well, one of these uh, factors that a number of political scientists have studied is what is sometimes referred to as geographic and residential sorting. And what they mean by that is a, the degree to which people tend to cluster geographically or residentially with people very much like themselves rather than living in geographic areas and even neighborhoods within those regions that are more diverse in their composition. Now, Geographical and residential sorting, if you want to use that term, that's something that, um, well, you, you almost risk making it sound like it's an entirely self-selected or voluntary process, when in reality, a lot of the changes we've seen in terms of the, the composition, let's say, partisan, in, in terms of partisanship and ideology within the major regions of the United States, a lot of those stem from long-term demographic changes related to urbanization, internal migration patterns, and racial and ethnic diversity. But let's look, for example, at the partisan distribution of votes geographically during the 2000 pres uh, 2016 presidential election. Now, usually when you see a map of, of uh, presidential election outcomes in the United States, the, the typical map is one where they just kind of, you know, either uh, do all the states either red or blue showing the electoral college outcomes in each state or they'll kind of do solid red or solid blue by county and it makes it look like everything is all sort of homogeneous within those big blobs of either red or blue color. This is how the 2016 presidential election outcomes looked the, in terms of the popular vote if you don't like use red and blue solidly within states or entire counties, but instead if you're more kind of granular and show the red and blue for the Republican and Democratic uh, popular votes, where people were actually living and voting. And what you can see here is that, first of all, there are some, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of homogeneity within certain regions of the country. Uh, the blue democratic portions are heavily concentrated in coastal areas as well as certain areas of the Northeast and Upper Midwest, uh, typically in highly urbanized uh, metropolitan areas. Then you have other areas of the country that are pretty homogeneous in terms of, of Republican Party dominance and then finally, you have vast areas of the country where there's not a lot there at all. Um, uh, that's, you know, that's something that has um, really kind of evolved over the last few decades, especially as the way voting and partisanship look, especially as measured by presidential elections. And one of the things that I should add here that's, that's examined by political scientists as well is the degree to which areas that have witnessed uh, over the last few decades unusual levels of out-migration and aging, meaning that they have aging populations um, in part through the sort of the exodus or out-migration of younger people those are areas that, that tend to be kind of concentrated in sort of the, the, the red Republican and kind of sparsely colored rural areas of the United States. Um, and I can even speak from personal experience here. Before 
I, I did my doctorate degree at University of California, San Diego, so I was living in a large metropolitan area in Southern California. Uh, before that, I lived in uh, Seattle, Washington for 10 years, which was another very kind of uh, large metropolitan coastal area. Now I live down here, but in between Southern California and here, I lived up in uh, North Dakota for a few years, teaching at the University of North Dakota and dealing with, uh, well, I, I probably don't need to say very much about what it's like going from Southern California to North Dakota, other than to say that I was very glad to be back down here in a place like Southwest Florida after a few years of dealing with uh, weekly blizzards in North Dakota. But one of the things that that, that places like North Dakota and even the state where I grew up, Iowa, have had to deal with over the last few decades is that they have outstanding K through 12 schools. They have lots of really smart, hip young people. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, there are not, the, the, the differences between a 16 year old in North Dakota and a 16 year old in Seattle or San Diego are not especially pronounced, but what, what I ended up kind of realizing and what is a kind of a recurrent problem that states like North Dakota and Iowa have to deal with is that a lot of their most kind of enter enterprising, you know, driven young people, once they reach a certain age, uh, an unusual percentage of them will, 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 will migrate to other areas, even if they're just moving to a place like uh, Chicago or Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Twin Cities, there's a lot of out migration and that has, that has impacted demographically uh, many areas of the country in ways that are kind of aligned with what I called a little bit earlier, geographic and residential sorting. Those areas of the country in terms of age are less diverse than they were a few decades ago. If we go, if we look at U.S. Uh, diversity racially by county in the United States, similarly, uh, the, the darker the areas there, the, the higher the level of racial and ethnic diversity. Once again, you can see in ways that to a significant degree align with the map that I was showing earlier, uh, a, a, a lot, there's, there's some consistency in between the areas with greater racial and ethnic diversity and uh, uh, conservative versus liberal uh, presidential voting outcomes that are again kind of reflective of a kind of geographic and residential sorting. Also, and here I've got a couple of slides that show this. Um, one of the things that's been very interesting that, that a lot of uh, election analysts have looked at is that over the last few decades, what we've been seeing is that an increasing number of counties throughout the country are uncompetitive. And what I mean by uncompetitive here, the way that's measured is where the presidential candidate who won the two party popular vote did so by by 20 percentage points or more. Counties where there was just sort of a landslide victory, so to speak, by the winning presidential candidate. Starting in 1992, and, and the counties where we're talking about the, the winning presidential candidate having won by 20 percentage points or more, they're co colored either red or blue, depending on whether it was a, a Republican or, pre or Democratic uh, presidential victory. Starting in 1992 and moving uh, every few years toward the present, what you can see moving up to 2016 is, is that there has been an enormous increase in the number of counties in the United States where uh, essentially the winning president has done so in a landslide vote. Um, that again is something that is reflective of or tied to sort of the geographic and residential sorting I was referring to earlier. Another factor that a lot of political scientists and even pundits have focused on in their discussions about why we might be witnessing increasing levels of political polarization in the United States uh, is tied to what is regarded as a rising level of partisan gerrymandering in congressional house and state legislative districts around the country. Political, uh, partisan gerrymandering refers to a, a process or a practice, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, 
through which in the drawing of either house district lines or state legislative district lines, you know, they're not done in sort of a nice little kind of checkerboard way. I think most people probably know that, but there's a, a lot of complex stuff involved in how you draw the boundaries of house and legislative districts uh, in American politics at both the federal and state level. There's been an increasing level of partisan gerrymandering in the United States in both the House and state legislative levels over the last few decades. And what I mean by that is a, a rising level of, of district line drawing through which there is a strategic effort being made to concentrate voters in a way that will ensure the victory, a safe victory of either one or the other party on a consistent basis. Many forms of gerrymandering in the United States are illegal, such as racial gerrymandering, but uh, partisan gerrymandering, at least you know, uh, at, at the present time, is not something that is constitutionally impermissible. I mean, there was even a recent Supreme Court case on this. Uh, the other thing that I might add here is that partisan gerrymandering uh, to the degree that it's contributed to political polarization, it's, it's, been, it's been facilitated by a lot of changes in modern technology. There's a lot that can be done now technologically that lets you, you know, in a really granular way, kind of calculate the most strategically advantageous approach for drawing district lines in a way that will ensure the victory by one or another party. So part of the reason why partisan gerrymandering has increased over time the last few decades is because of technological changes. It's not because uh, political you know, candidates were less partisan in the past so much as it is the fact that now there are technological means through which this can be carried out uh, more effectively. Little chart here showing the number of districts that have leaned Republican, leaned Democratic, or were competitive in the last two presidential elections relative to the country overall. What you can see here is that there's, there's, a, there's an increasing divergence here uh, that again reflects uh, a rising level of partisanship in the United States. Another important contributing factor um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this at the end when I'm talking about potential remedies or how I envision the future. Uh, there have been some important changes in information technology and information services that arguably have contributed to rising levels of political polarization in the United States. Um, and this is something that I imagine everybody here is cognizant of. This is something that's always kind of lurking in the background, even in terms of your industry. Over the last few decades, with rising you know, sophistication and prevalence of electronic sources of information, there has been a corresponding decline in what you might call exposure to common or widespread information sources. And what I mean by that is that, you know, Instead of people sitting down and you know, all watching the CBS Evening News, the ABC Evening News, going into a public library, going into a bricks and mortar bookstore, wandering around the aisles and looking at books and getting surprised by things they may not have been searching for, instead with the rising kind of levels of and sophistication of contemporary technology, more and more people are gravitating toward extremely narrow and self-reinforcing information sources. And this has been facilitated by the rise of cable television with its proliferation of more diverse information sources that are also much more heavily focused and targeted, social media services and online streaming services. Uh, in all of these cases, what a lot of survey researchers have found is that, uh, you know, People you know, who tend to rely heavily upon electronic information sources, whether it's uh, by doing Google searches, whether it's by you know, news that's provided through Facebook or Twitter, things like that, is they tend to gravitate toward what they already think and what they already believe. 
And, you know, unless they are also kind of extending their way into these more common or widespread media sources that tend to be more centrist in nature and diverse in their perspectives, what they essentially end up uh, doing is they kind of inhabit what are variously referred to as information silos or echo chambers, where they just kind of just keep looking and at and reading the same thing and only kind of conversing virtually with others who are very similar to themselves. All of this, of course, has been facilitated and driven by big technology, big data, and the like. Um, but in addition to what I've just described, that phenomenon, I, I also have to draw attention to, as many political scientists have, to the degree to which big technology and politicians now are using big tech, big data, so-called big data, uh, and micro-targeting strategies in their political communication and campaigning. Uh, more and more now, a lot of political information that's, that's disseminated by campaign teams and the like, and by interest groups that are working on behalf or, of one or another of the two major political parties, more and more they are utilizing social media services that are, are targeted very specifically toward um, groups that they identify as being uh, most strategically useful for their purposes. And they're, they're relying less and less upon print and uh, major television advertising. Uh, the last, the most recent data I looked at like this, which is only available now because um, up until just like the last year or two, um, big technology companies like Facebook and Google would not, they would not hand over the data that would be needed to do these kinds of analyses. But now that they're doing it, uh, what we've been able to see is uh, that there have been some pronounced shifts in how pol politicians, political interest groups, and the like are targeting very specific segments of the population in sort of a, a, a very granular or microscopic way. Right now, uh, you know, up to date uh, in, the, in this presidential election cycle, approximately 85% of the advertising spending has gone towards social media services and online sources like Facebook and Google. Only 15% have been directed toward regular television and print media. And that's something that you're likely to see an increase in in the future. Uh, and a lot of it is highly sophisticated now. Okay, the future. How do I think the future looks? What do I think the remedies are? Um, wow, if I, knew, if I knew the remedies, I could probably cash in on it. As far as the future goes, um, I, I feel very confident in predicting that there will be increasing reliance upon micro, so-called micro-targeting and um, electronic uh, social services media and other forms of electronic communication sources when it comes to politics in the United States. The reason for that is that it, it, it's, it's proving itself to be quite valuable and quite successful in terms of the outcomes that it's, that it's engineered. Um, I think at times people can be um, a, a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe a little bit oblivious to the degree to which uh, certain politicians and political organizations rely upon micro-targeting through electronic uh, media. Um, Donald Trump, of course, people, I think, I think the popular image of Donald Trump is that he's always up at two in the morning, you know, tweeting wildly and erratically and the like. And I guess probably he does. I'm sure his political advisors wish that they could kind of, you know, steal his cell phone away and hide it. But, but associated with Donald Trump, and certainly in terms of the people who are working uh, in the background, which includes people like Steve Bannon, who was the sort of the creator of Breitbart News, which was one of the best known uh, kind of conservative, kind of new conservative information sources starting back a number of years ago. Uh, they're making very ample use of micro-targeting. Um, Steve, Steve Bannon, for example, I mean, I think he's kind of regarded as this kind of heretical or maverick figure, you know, and just has no place in American politics. But, I mean, Steve Bannon is a, 
I mean, he is a highly cerebral strategic thinker who was uh, really the person, for those of you who followed the news some about uh, some of the scandals associated with, uh, you know, sort of propagandistic advertising being disseminated through Facebook and the like, uh, which was largely facilitated by a British analytics firm called Cambridge Analytics. Cambridge Analytics was uh, essentially a creation of Steve, Steve Bannon. He wasn't doing the analytic work, but he was the one who kind of foresaw, I think, the strategic value of this kind of micro-targeting. So I think I think we're going to see an increasing reliance upon this kind of electronic, technology-based micro-targeting in, in the years ahead. Um, and I, I lament that, but I think that's likely to be the case. Um, I don't anticipate in the near future a, a decrease or cessation in this uh, trend toward increasing political polarization. Right now, we're still in an era, I think, where a lot of people are concerned about it, but I don't think yet we've transitioned to a phase where there's sufficient consensus on how we should deal with it so that the remedies might emerge. Ultimately, I think the, the, the potential remedies, I mean, I don't think that human nature is going to change. I guess I kind of am aligned with the, you know, the so-called Federalists from the Constitutional period, people like James Madison who thought that self-interest and factionalism are just part of the human condition. I think that's kind of the way we're programmed or hardwired. But kind of like the, the, the constitutional architects, I think that while we can't change human nature, there are ways that we can kind of stabilize or strengthen political institutions and civic institutions in a way that can at least mitigate the problems that are posed by factionalism and political polarization. And that would, that would include strengthening and kind of, you know, in various ways trying to ensure the survival of separated powers and checks and balances in our government, which I think are probably on the decline, a long-term decline over the last few decades with increasing dysfunctions within Congress, perhaps in part because of, of you know, increasing political polarization and sort of a corresponding delegation by Congress of power to the executive branch. And oftentimes, and here I'm not just talking about the United States, I'm talking about other representative democracies in the world in Northern and Western Europe, oftentimes in recent decades when we've witnessed the rise of sort of these uh, what are sometimes referred to as authoritarian populist leaders, whether they're of the left or the right, who uh, you know are kind of you know you know mobilize or secure the backing of you know increasing portions of the population and threaten to kind of you know propel their countries into uh, kind of demagoguery. I mean, oftentimes that's tied to or kind of a, a consequence, I think, of dysfunctions an institutional gridlock at, at the, in the legislative spheres of government. So the United States is not alone when it comes to countries where um, the, the dangers of rising executive power, I, I think, are, are, are tied to these rising levels of political polarization and dysfunction in the legislative branches. Um, Finally, one last thing, and here I'm just offering this as, a, as an expression of hope or optimism. Um, as I've indicated, I kind of regard self-interest and factionalism as an intrinsic feature of the human condition, but I also feel that we have a capacity when institutions are, are kind of uh, you know, designed in ways that will bring us into closer contact with others who are not like ourselves and kind of structure our interactions so that there's um, sort of a, 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 a more favorable space for constructive dialogue and problem solving. I think we actually have a capacity for that as well. If you ever get a chance to do so, you might want to look at some of the recent efforts that have made, been made by various nonprofit organizations and a number of universities like Stanford University and the University of Chicago to experiment with, with settings where they will bring in a randomly selected sample of the U.S. population 
you know, for a weekend or for a week, uh, provide them certain information about policies, allow them to question experts about the policies, and then they do pre-test and sort of post-test uh, post surveys of these. And what they found is that in those kinds of settings where you bring people across the political spectrum into these arenas and you allow them to constructively dialogue with one another and get some nonpartisan information, what they found is that the, the, the level of consensus actually increases dramatically among both Republicans and Democrats, you know, looking at where they were, uh, you know, when they were, you know, they took a survey before they started and then where they were after they, they completed this exercise. Those have consistently shown some reduced, dramatically reduced levels of polarization and rising levels of consensus among the people who have done that. So maybe if there are ways that through various types of civic organizations or interest groups, we can uh, kind of engineer those opportunities or those arenas uh, for more diverse dialogues, that may be a way of mitigating the problem of factions. And finally, here I'm just giving a shout out to books. Um, I, I, I really think and, and feel that a lot of the problem would, would be less severe if more people would wander into public libraries and wander into bricks and mortar bookstores where you wander the aisles and you aren't just going on to Amazon and searching for the specific book or type of book that you're looking for. That's that kind of you know, micromanagement again. They're telling you what you should look for based on what they've seen your browsing habits are in the past. How are we doing time-wise? Okay. All right. Any questions? Yes. Uh, going back to your chart on divergence, uh, it looked like the convergence was during the Depression, the, the closest convergence was during the Depression and the World War. Yeah. Is, is it going to take some type of catastrophic uh, event like that? Well, I, I, it, 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 it may. I mean, there, I mean, a lot of people kind of have pointed to the, the fact that if there's sort of a common major catastrophic problem or enemy that can kind of galvanize the public's attention, that is something that can produce, you know, you know reduce levels of partisanship and polarization. The question is that, you know, yes, it can do that, but is that going to be sustainable or an enduring you know, change, or is that something that's going to be kind of cyclical and kind of, you know, go on the wane, so to speak, once you move farther in time from the event in question? But yeah, I mean, you know, there's no question but that the levels of consensus and um, levels of po political polarization were more promising, uh, especially in the, the immediate aftermath of World War II and during sort of the height of the Cold War. Um, so it may take it may take something like that. I'm just not sure if that will, you know, be sustainable over time. May I think I saw one other person with a hand up. Anybody else? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I think it. I think it is among other, other forms of organization in the United States. I mean, for a long time, I mean, sort of a contemporary version of the Federalist ideas about factionalism and how you deal with them. Uh, for a, a number of decades, it was known as it was sort of theories of pluralism or political pluralism in the United States, and what they basically contended was that. What, what keeps things moving well and kind of working properly in the United States, it isn't just our institutions of government, it's also the fact that we have a relatively, what we have a system of governance that's relatively open to interest group influence and lobbying, whether it be business organizations, nonprofits, religious organizations, ethnic groups, uh, public interest groups, basically political pluralism and its, its advocates said one of the ways we make checks and balances work is by having a relatively open permeable system of government 
that allows all these different types of organizations to present their, their positions to their governmental representatives. And it doesn't mean that anyone should prevail. It just means that you have a government that's a kind of institutional referee that's open to these diverse influences, including influ the influence of business. Um, so yeah, I would say that um, an effective system of political pluralism that knows how to kind of referee and make uh, significant use of all these diverse sources of, of organized information, I think that's a healthy thing. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, folks. <laughs>